can we hear me, can we hear me? Can you hear me? Is it coming through the speaker? Seems a bit quiet to me. Is there anybody there? No, I can't hear it. Ah, that's better, isn't it? Because I'm mute. Um, register going around. Please do sign. I'm trying to do so many different things in this lecture. I've already been, I've been tripped up by the fact that Blackboard's not available at the moment where my slides were, but luckily I had another copy. So, you are going to get your test back to look at in a minute. Um, not in a minute, actually, towards the end of the lecture, so relax. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just, just to go through those to check that you're okay with the marking. The marking was done by a robot. So who knows whether it's correct or not. Today we're going to be looking at attention. I expect there's going to be some questions at the end about posters and such like as well. Um, but I also wanted to tell you, uh, just to remind you, that there is this unit, um, which is a two-day unit, which I think is at the beginning of February. Two days at the beginning of February. Is it second and third, is it? First, first and second. First and second of February. And if you're interested in this unit, the, sorry, if you're interested in the current unit, Brain, Mind and Education, and perhaps you're thinking about using physiological measures, simple physiological measures like heartbeat, respiration, uh, um, electrodermal activity, EEG, very simple EEG, um, you might be interested in attending this unit. We only have a, a maximum of 12 students that can go on this unit, but we have four spaces, the office has told me. So I'm very keen that those four spaces are taken up as soon as possible. Um, essentially, this unit teaches you how to collect physiological measures of cognition, such as skin conductance, where, I mean, better known as a polygraph, I think that's what they call it in the United States anyway telling us about your anxiety levels but there are other types of data that you'll learn to use such as heart rate, breathing rate, um, skin temperature which is a good measure of surprise for example um, and some simple electroencephalography as well it's a lot of fun, it's very hands-on this is a photograph from one of the uh, from when the unit was run last year and the first day, well actually both days are very much practical and hands-on. You collect data from your partner and then you swap turns and you learn how to both collect it and also how to analyse it using uh, the biopack system. And of course if you're thinking that you might even possibly use these sorts of methods in your dissertation then this is an absolute must really in terms of doing this unit. The assignment is 2,000 word assignment, but it's basically a write-up of your own experiment. And you can choose what sort of topic you want to do, and you can vary it a little bit, but these are the sorts of things that you might end up doing. For example, the, effect of skin conduct, the effects on skin conductivity of winning and losing during a learning game, heart rate associated with time running out when you're doing an educational task, the effect of exercise on breathing rate in an educational task, does it improve learning? Um, the effects of different incidents when playing an action video game on skin temperature and can you relate that to memory? The effect on alpha wave emission, doing a simple EEG experiment, on relaxation prior to a maths test and is that correlated with how you do in the maths test? So those sorts of questions can be answered um, on that unit and I would advise anybody who's thinking of doing it, can you please sign up as soon as possible. We have four spaces left, it's a 10 credit unit, runs on the 1st and 2nd of February next term. Does anybody have any questions about that? Yes? It is not possible to audit the unit because the constraint is on the use of the equipment. So. You know, unless there's a space, unless we actually have a real space left. If we have any spaces left, then it is possible to audit it. Yes, it's not a it's 
I, no, I don't think it is. No, no, it's not. No. Okay, so what we're doing today is looking at attention, and we'll be talking a lot about working memory. And you've come across working memory before, I think. You'll have come across it in cognition, for example, yes? And you'll be coming across it again now. And actually, that's very useful to come across the same concept in different applications. It also helps you remember the concept as well as be able to apply it in new situations. We'll be talking about the supervisory attentional system, which is quite an old phrase, but I can't think of a better one. But basically, we're talking about what parts of the brain are involved in paying attention. Paying attention is not a scientific phrase. It is an educational phrase or a, a public phrase you know, used in common language. What do we mean by paying attention? People often say, I have trouble with my children paying attention in class. Well, of course, they are paying attention. They're just not paying attention necessarily to what you want them to pay attention to. So scientists think about attention in a slightly different way to um, non-specialists or, or, or non-specialists in, in psychology and neuroscience. We'll be coming across the anterior cingulate cortex. It's a very important region of the brain. Um, and also prefrontal cortex. And in a way, those two regions are the best candidates we have for, the, for the, the central paying attention part of the brain, if you like. And there's a bit of a discussion over what role each of those plays and which is more in charge than the other. And then we'll be looking at attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, otherwise known as ADHD. And this might well be a topic that some of you are choosing for your um, poster essay. Is this correct? Put your hand up if you're doing ADHD. Ah, uh, yes, so there you are. Um, and I always like to do too much in these lectures, really. But I, I also like to put in a couple of teaching and learning notes. Uh, the, the methods that I use to try to in, engage you and try to help you construct your thinking, consolidate your learning, are linked to my understanding of brain function, and I like to share that with you. So a little bit later on, we'll be looking at some of the errors we made in our test. <laughs> Why would we do that? Why is that a good thing to do from, from an educational point of view? How can I explain that to you in terms of how the brain operates? And we'll also be looking at working memory, which is a concept that you've come across before, but we're looking at it in a new context. And why is that helpful to understanding what working memory is? Those two mysteries will be explained at the end of the lecture. Okay, so I said we were going to talk about working memory. In a very simple sense, you can think about it as a, a bucket in which you place the things that you are consciously attending to at this moment. It's very limited. Maybe we can only put in around seven, it has been estimated, chunks of information at one time. And I've drawn it here, at that bucket, that buffer, would be a more scientific way of putting it, at the front of the brain, because dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you know where that is now, yes, very related to working memory. But actually, if you think about working memory as the persistence of neuronal firing, then it could occur in many other regions than just the prefrontal cortex. But that tends to be a region of the brain very much involved with conscious attention. So it kind of makes sense that we, that we are particularly interested in DLPFC when it comes to talking about working memory. So in a simple way, when somebody says something to you like, oh, we walked across the Clifton Suspension Bridge. You can imagine all sorts of different ways in which that is encoded in your brain. Lots of different types of information in terms of its location, um, which could be activating parietal regions, in terms of its colour, which could be activating temporo-occipital regions, um, in terms of its shape, apparently inferior temporal regions. I have to check that some point. Apparently, inferior temporal regions are involved with memory for location, uh, for shape, sorry. I suppose that's because it's visual-spatial. That would make sense, actually, yes. 
And the, all, all of those different representations that are associated with walking across the Clifton Suspension Bridge can be activated, and if you're conscious of them, then they are in your working memory. And so you can think about the information from those different regions being drawn into your bucket or your buffer, which is very limited, in partic and, and, and particularly associated with frontal regions that you're, where you are consciously attending now to that information. I mean, you had the information in your brain before, didn't you? Because it must have been there, but you weren't conscious, consciously attending to it. So, for some reason, somehow, that information has come forward and it's now represented by neural networks activating in your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. We can only hold on to that information for a short period of time, because actually, if you are constantly focusing on something, it makes it very difficult to do something else. And of course, this is the basis of maths anxiety which is becoming um, a real focus of attention now in the science world. We've finally realised that some people get really anxious about maths. And, it, and the problem with that is, is not so much that... Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, the problem with really is that it's occupying their working memory. Because they, that anxiety is displacing... By activating the working memory with anxious thoughts, it's displacing your ability to be able to think about the maths. And that mass information may be at the back of your brain, but you cannot make it conscious and therefore make it useful because your working memory is occupied by all of these anxious thoughts. Yes? Yeah, because you're thinking about something else, essentially. Yeah, because you're actually putting your conscious attention somewhere else. Sir? Um. The, is, the working, I don't know, just the idea that the, the working memory is the stuff you're conscious of, that just doesn't feel phenomenologically bright to me. It just feels like you're not conscious of a lot of it. There's like, if you tell, you know, that kind of 7 plus or minus 2, if you tell, tell someone to remember that, a lot of the time you're not actually conscious of those seven pieces of information. And, and it's just kind of, I'm having trouble um, I think I think the trouble with that is that question. It's a good question, and I agree with you. It doesn't feel phenomenologically right to me either. I had to just show I could say that. But <laughs> <laughs> but the real the question that underlies your question is what is consciousness? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> and I had I did make it clear at the beginning of the unit I was not prepared to discuss that. <laughs> but I think the way that people try to find out if you're really conscious of something by, by a variety of different means so if it's crossing if it's, it's sometimes it, if people want to know if you're conscious of something that you're doing then every now and then they'll put a little probe in they go, beep, little light will come on and then you have to answer honestly by pressing a button whether you were really thinking about it at that point in time so those are the sorts of tricks that, that scientists play to try to probe whether somebody is conscious of a piece of information or not but the trouble is, well, the trouble is, you're trying to marry two perspectives here, which are very difficult to marry. One is the phenomenological. Thank you very much. Where you're inside it yourself, aren't you? You're yeah. inside yourself, looking at it, you're thinking, what, are, what, you know, what does this actually feel like? Yeah. And then you've got your scientist on the outside who is looking in, and they've got to make these objective judgments. In a way, they're they're trying to exclude your personal experience and your personal perspective. So this is where, I mean, this is seriously why I find some of the research on consciousness very difficult um, and problematic because consciousness you could argue um, is a phenomenological experience because actually you can probably do a lot of things unconsciously that are quite clever you know but are you conscious of you're doing them I don't know so I, 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 I agree with you it's an interesting point but I think I'm gonna park it because I can't cope with consciousness at the moment just, I mean I mean I just kind of feel like they might um, they've kind of access Could be talking about yeah. Could be talking about consciousness defined in a different way, perhaps. Yeah, that might get us around it. So, I mean, and it's right, of course. You know, working memory. We're talking about attention. We're talking about consciousness, and we're going to get more entangled with this problem of consciousness quite soon.
But isn't it nice to be able to have these simple models, um, such as created by Alan Badley? Visual Spatial Sketch Pad, that's where you're keeping in your conscious attention information about shape and where things are and location and such things, things that you could actually sketch. You're keeping that in your visual spatial sketch pad. You can imagine a little man inside your brain or woman sort of just sketching on things, keeping it there, but it's very temporary and then it fades. Um, or your phonological loop, where if you're trying to remember information that can be spoken, um, then it's kind of like repeating it, you know, in this phonological loop that's going round and round. And who is in charge of those things? Well, the, the central executive. The central executive decides what is going on the visual spatial sketch pad, what is going in the phonological loop. <coughs> but unfortunately, um, you know, this, these box and arrow models that are so beloved of, of psychology don't really match up very well to, to um, brain function. So they or some of them anyway, and this unfortunately is one of them. Because when you look inside the brain and you ask people to focus on attention, their attention on stuff which is very spatial, so they should be using their visual spatial sketch pad, and then stuff which is not spatial, so presumably they're using their phonological loop, if you look at the difference between those activities, that should give you an idea of where the visual, visual spatial sketch pad is in your brain and where the phonological loop is in the brain. Ah, oh, ice creams. <laughs> I just thought it looked a bit like you know what I mean. Ice creams. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, Katie. Um, and, and what we don't see what we don't see is a very clear um, differentiation between these in the brain. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense talking about, you know, in terms of actual what's going on concretely in the brain in terms of a visual spatial sketch pad or a phonological loop. Yes? They're, they're useful for, um, they're describing the, the experience of it, aren't they? You can, you can conceive of, I mean, they're useful in terms of mapping it Yes. Uh, we never no. Brain that way, so no. I can we have to simplify things, yeah. don't we? That's the thing. Because, you know, if you look at it from a purely neural point of view, the result is going to be, oh, actually, it's really, really complicated. And you say, well, that's very accurate, but how helpful is that? You know? Um, so, of course, there is always a compromise between something which is quite simple, yeah. but hopefully not too simplistic, and something which is very realistic, but just too complex to actually be useful. Um, so, yeah, you know, you have to, in fairness... I think uh, it's quite a good experience, but when, when we came across this in cognition and learning, I was like, oh, yeah, there is that bit at the front, kind of, as you kind of, you know, conceive of it, and then the chronological, and the, you know, it's kind of the internal experience, isn't it, rather than the objective study of the... Yes, um, but the trouble is that experience can deceive us, oh, yeah, you know, and that's, and that's, that, that's the problem. Um, what's the difference between um, that argument and, and just coming up with ideas which are kind of intuitive and, and feel like they make sense, but actually, ha you know, are quite, they can be more misleading than the things that don't feel they make sense, if you know what I mean, because they're very, very convincing. Uh, yes? Uh, didn't Badly revise that model anyway? Yeah, he did quite a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit of a devil's advocate here, really. I've got to admit. But um, and, and actually, the psychological models of, of working memory are in a constant state of revision. And the, the good thing is that they're constantly in a state of revision in the light of what we're understanding about how the brain works. So the next thing you might do, if you're thinking, well, okay, it doesn't seem to, the brain doesn't seem to differentiate very clearly, or it doesn't seem to have separate brain regions for these two different types of working memory. How should we categorise working memory? What would be make more sense? And what appears to make more sense is categorising it in terms of whether you are just holding the information in your head, like when somebody gives you a phone number and you're thinking of 278 where you're looking for a pen, you know. And when you're actually manipulating it. So you know, you're thinking, right, I've got £530 to the end of the month, and that means that, you know, and I've got to pay my food out of that, and I'm going to have to pay the rent. And then you're manipulating that information. <coughs> and what we see is that 
if you that those two things, manipulation and maintenance, uh, where, you know, so you're, when you're operating on the information or whether you're just keeping it in your consciousness, that does seem to involve different brain regions. So maybe it's more sensible to think about working memory less in terms of visual spatial sketch bad and phonological loop and more in terms of the way in which it's differentiated in the brain in terms of just consciously attending or actually operating on the information. So these, these are the ways in which the neuroscience sort of feeds into the psychology and says, OK, we'll throw away that box and arrows model and we'll produce another box and arrows model which is a little bit closer to, to the reality. But of course, there's a, there's a central question here, which is leading us dangerously towards consciousness, um, of you know, how does that information actually get selected for working memory? How do you decide what you are going to hold in your consciousness? Do you consciously do that? And if you, you know, and if we, if, we, if we find that region, is that the region which is really the executive executive, you know, the, the, the one that's really in charge? Is that you in your brain? This is how, you know, very quickly, you, you start going into these regions which I feel very unsure about, which is, which, which are, you know, where are you in your brain, if you like? Um, so sometimes the prefrontal cortex is seen as a sort of a dynamic filtering system. It, it can change, but it, you know, and it can be reconfigured. But essentially, it's it's filtering what's coming in, and deciding, yeah, that's important, that isn't important. Um, and so that may have quite an important role in terms of deciding what you are going to hold in your in your consciousness. But the working memory certainly requires some sort of attentional component in which you decide this is more important than that. I think it's more important to be attending to Paul's lecture than thinking about what I'm going to eat for dinner. So, <laughs> or vice versa. But, but certainly it needs somebody to be in charge of, of who, you know, what information is going to feature in your consciousness. So one reason which, which has been a, a potential candidate for this has been the anterior cingulate cortex. Deep down, inside, between the hemispheres, an island of cortex created by the wrinkliness, creating a, a surface on the cortex that you can't see, but is on the left and the right hemisphere, as you can see here. And anterior, of course, is the front part of it. So cingulate means island, anterior means front. So it's the front of that island of cortex, um, shortened to the ACC quite often. And this is the sort of task where you'd expect the anterior cingulate to particularly be involved. Because this is where you are saying, no, I am supposed to be reading the word, not looking at the colour. The first one is quite straightforward. The colour of the word and the spelling of the, and the, the meaning of the word are congruent. So it's easy to read green, red, blue, purple, blue, purple. But then it, you're going to be slightly slower when you're reading blue, purple, red, green, purple, green because the colour and the meaning of the word are not congruent. And you're going to be even slower if you're trying to name the colour. So if you're trying to name the colour of the print in the first one, very straightforward you're being told the answer by the meaning of the word. But when you start saying, with the second lot, you're going red, green, um, blue, blue, red, you, you really have to, I mean, I find myself, I haven't that much sleep, maybe that's why, but I find I really have to struggle with that. Because all the time, my automatic reading response, and remember we were talking about how automatic reading is, um, is trying to make me say something else. So I have to really pay attention. So this is one area where you would really expect that part of the brain, which is supposed to be in charge of your conscious attention, to be highly involved. And we see the anterior cingulate activating greatly. In fact, um, it's been suggested that the anterior cingulate may be the home 
of this supervisory attentional system. Uh, in other words, the part of your brain that's deciding what you're going to attend to. Because it doesn't just activate for the Stroop test, it activates for anything which is difficult. So we see the anterior cingulate activating a lot during MRI experiments where we're challenging people. A lot when you give somebody something new to do. A lot when there has to be some error correction, so you're having to think critically about what's going on. And particularly when you're overcoming habitual responses, like reading. When you're not supposed to read the word, you're supposed to say what colour the word is. So that's a pretty good candidate. Well, how could we test this further? Well, one way of testing it further would be to look at which system is involved first. Now, we're talking about timing now, because I'm talking about which system is involved first. So why would we not use functional magnetic resonance imaging, for example, to do that? Poor temporal resolution. Although it is getting better, but there are different ways around that. But essentially, it doesn't do stuff at the level of milliseconds. Whereas EEG, which is a direct measure of changes in electrical field due to activations of neurons, that is very good at timing. That can give you millisecond responses. So all we have to do is to compare the um, electrical change in the field with in two, in two conditions. One where somebody is doing something automatically and one where they're actually having to employ their executive attention. So we show people um, <coughs> we show people a word, chair, and all we ask them to do is to repeat the word. It's very easy. You can do that automatically, almost without being conscious. Then we ask people in another condition to generate any word that's related to that. Now that, re that requires you to activate your consciousness. You must not say the word, you must say a word that's related to it. And what we see in the activity in the brain as measured by EEG is that this part of the brain here, which is the brown trace, that activates first. You get a peak in that region of the brain first. And then, and only later, well, a few milliseconds, not very much later, oh, I don't know, actually, 230, so it's about half a second later, actually. Half a second later, you see activation in prefrontal cortex, temporal cortex. So this, I mean, this could be bringing in some extra information, I don't know. But this here, well, that's probably the prefrontal cortex setting up now the representations of the required information that are relevant to the goal that's been decided upon by the cingulate cortex. So it's the cingulate cortex that appears to be in charge. Well, for every claim, there's always a counterclaim, and you know, you is it you know that sounds very convincing, but is it possible that actually all the anterior cingulate does is look for regions of conflict? It just sends you a signal saying, conflict, conflict, watch out, watch out, this is problem, this is difficult. And actually it's the prefrontal cortex that makes the decision as to whether it's going to take any notice of that and what it's going to do about it, you could argue. So then there is this big discussion about actually who is in control, which part of your brain is in control. Um, we know that the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex, is a very important part of your attentional network. We know that, if there's damage to it, there are going to be problems, we see it activating very early on in any process requiring some additional attention. But we can only be totally sure that it's a very important part of it. Um, and it's, it is quite possible the prefrontal cortex you know, mediates the response and can even override that response if it wants to. And so a safer, happier explanation of what's going on is that we've got both the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate actually in a, a dialogue with each other, working together. Um, but if, we're gonna, and if you're going to look for consciousness in the brain, probably those two regions and what they're doing together um, might be the place to, to start. Complex two-way interaction. Okay, so you should all have, uh, we find out now because a few people came in late so you might not have this. Can you put your hand if you haven't got one of these? Because I'm filming this, I do have to I do try not to 
copyright too much. I should, I should have told you that you're being filmed. No, not you're not being filmed, but the, the audio is being recorded, so please, <laughs> please do not swear. I want to ask something. Yes? Actually, do you want to just pass those? It would probably be easier, wouldn't it? If you just pass those in that direction. Yes? If we do anything, does that mean our similar cortex, uh, similar cortex, and preferential cortex always be active? Every complete, every complete, every single region. So I've just been asked if, um, if these two regions are so important to our paying of attention, does that mean that they are like constantly active and they're constantly in, in some important sort of dialogue in almost everything that we do? And the answer is yes, essentially. Yes, um, anything, you know, where you're, certainly where you're paying conscious attention, you will see those regions activate. And that's one of the reasons why when we're interested to know what regions are particularly involved with like reading, for example, we have to compare reading, which is a conscious um, activity, and so, well, hang on, I'll just say it's automatic, I? but you have to decide that you're going to do it, so you are going to be allocating resources, conscious resources to it, to another type of task, uh, which also you have to make a decision to allocate conscious resources to, and you know, if you're, if one of part of the task is pressing a button, then you have to make sure that you're pressing a button in both of those tasks, and then compare the difference. So your reading task um, has to be very similar to your non-reading task in everything except the reading, because there are many parts of the brain that are going to be activated in almost the simplest of active, simplest of tasks, like pressing a button. So, um, what I wanted to show you on this handout, I've now left, not left myself with one. <laughs> Sorry, there's a spare one, there's a spare one there, thank you. Um, is that you can divide the anterior cingulate again uh, by two, and you can see that there are some regions that appear to be more related to cognition than there are to emotion. Now, cognition and emotion are so closely intertwined that it's been argued it's, it's almost meaningless to talk about one without the other. So what are we talking about here? Well, I think it's important to give you an example. So if we were saying a mathematics task, where you haven't got maths anxiety, so there's no emotional aspects to it, or some sort of logical task, compare with, which is just about numbers. Compare that to a task where you're having to make a moral decision. So the sorts of tasks that they look at here are we have limited resources to provide um, a group of people who are stranded on a desert island or make it even more real and say, you know, we have 1,000 refugees, we haven't got enough food, we know they're going to need for the next two weeks, how should we allocate the food? Should we allocate it differently? You know, and suddenly you're thinking, oh, the children, all oh, the people who are sick, and it becomes something more than just a logical problem. It requires moral thinking and emotional response. Once it's that sort of task, you see the more ventral regions activating in the anterior cingulate cortex. So if it's purely logical, you, you tend to see the more dorsal regions. If it starts involving emotional issues, then you see the more ventral regions activating. So. I don't want to give you the idea that the anterior cingulate is just like a blob. Actually, people are now um, regionalizing it into different regions for, you know, the differentiating and distinguishing different regions for different types of task. Okay, are there any questions about that before I go on to ADHD? Okie doke. Right, so um, I've got a few more up-to-date statistics in a minute, but ADHD um, is something that we're becoming more and more aware about. The levels of diagnosis are very different in different countries. There are a lot of controversies around ADHD in terms of its diagnosis and its treatment. 
In the US, uh, well, we've got like, around about sort of 5% of the global population, it's been estimated, but for some reason in the US we have much higher rates of diagnosis, so we have around 11% in 2011 of children. 11%! I mean, that's more than 1 in 10 children. That's really quite unusual um, for any sort of disorder, that level of prevalence. Is that overdiagnosis? Or is it just that parents, clinicians, teachers are more sensitive, careful and caring in the, in the US? I don't, I don't know. Um, and most of those children are on medication, 73%. But is that ADHD medication? Or it's, it's medication, yeah, for ADHD, which is very many different types. But right. we'll, have a look at that. we'll have a look at data for the UK in more detail. Um, now, this is where I'm, what I normally do is show this slide, but I updated the, uh, I updated the slides this morning because there's some more information on this now. But what I've been doing for the last few years has been sort of adding um, data points to the numbers of, of prescriptions that are being given out for um, Ritalin, or methylphenaldate would be a better way of saying it, Ritalin's a commercial name. So methylphenaldate, which is almost entirely um, used for the treatment of ADHD. And as you can see, there's sort of a, a f from this graph, you get the sense that it's sort of rising exponentially. And uh, I was excitedly looking to see where I was going to put my point for 2014 to 2015 a few days ago. Um, but it seems now the picture is more complicated than this. Or a better way of putting it would be simply counting the number of prescriptions may not be giving you an accurate idea of how um, administration of the drugs to children is changing. And generally I think it's probably good news that when you do a more fine grain analysis, as has been done by Bo Lidstrom uh, this year, you get the impression, uh, and here they weren't just looking at the sort of raw data that I, I was looking at. I was just simply looking at raw prescription rates for the uh, total amount of Ritalin that was being prescribed in the UK, which my guess is is still going up. So I can't quite understand how to, at the moment I can't quite understand how to relate this drug to the previous, this graph to the previous graph, because Ritalin prescriptions are clearly going exponentially up. But on the other hand, when you do a more fine grain analysis and you look at Ritalin and medication for ADHD to children, then it becomes clearer that in fact the prescriptions appear to be plateauing from around 2008 onwards. I, that's, I mean, that's what I'm assuming, that this must be adult prescriptions then. So what appears to be happening is that there's a retrospective diagnosis going on. And that's what's causing the increase in, in the prescriptions. But I, I don't know that. Um, and I have to talk to an expert about it. But I think you're right. It must, um, to my mind, it must suggest that the adult prescriptions are going up. Is that what you're going to say? No. no. When you look at these big statistics, could it be... That um, well, the, the paper suggested that there's better follow-up uh, in this country, and that in fact, um, you know, they, they they bothered to find out whether the children actually are benefiting from it and whether they continue to should need it, and then that may be resulting in children coming off it, um, whereas possibly in other countries that's not happening. Um, in, in the United States, it's ten times that rate, which is, which is, so there's clearly a difference in approach between the UK and the United States. So is this prevalent, or is this...? This is, this is how many children are on drugs for ADHD, basically. So it's not, so it's not um, new, so it's, it's, it's how they're taking it, yeah. It's how, it's how many ADHD drugs children are taking essentially.
However, it's still quite a lot. <laughs> so, so. Well, yes, I mean, that's it, you see. I mean, there's all sorts of political issues that come in. I mean, it may well be that there's not enough money to prescribe it always, and, and maybe there's some cost-based decisions <laughs> that are being made at the level of practitioners. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. But I would suggest, if you're interested, looking at the paper, which is why I put it. It's only just come out, and I haven't had a chance to read it properly myself. But it is on the previous slide, if you're interested. And I've, I've uploaded this updated slide now onto Blackboard. So what is ADHD? Well, there's three um, symptoms that are associated with it. Uh, inattentiveness, so being disorganised, forgetful, not bringing your homework diary to school, apparent dis apparently not investing effort in remembering, but, you know, that's, that's the appearance. Um, brief and changing activities, going from one thing to the next because you're having trouble focusing on, on one task. Overactivity, but that depends on context, and it's not always the case. Um, so, you know, you, you quite often find that children who have a diagnosis of ADHD have no problems, for example, attending to video games. Um, so, these things are all very contextually dependent. And impulsiveness, which is the thing which often drives teachers mad because we are asking a question to the class. And then there's somebody who's just sort of shouting out the answer instead of putting their hand up. <laughs> you know, and, and that can be uh, quite, quite disruptive if, if you've got that happening all the, all the time. That's all right, I wasn't no. <laughs> no, um, And all of this sort of begins to feel like a failure of those two brain regions sort of interacting. You can begin to imagine, yeah, actually, you know, if that mechanism in your brain that is deciding where you're going to allocate attention to, if that is not working properly, um, then that is going to obviously mean you're, you're paying very little attention to this task before you want to pay attention to this task. It's going to make you apparently overactive because you're going from one task to the next because your attention system is, is dotting everywhere. Um, and that could also explain impulsiveness because you've essentially not attending to the goal of the class which is to listen to teacher at this moment. You know, you, you've, you've just gone off on one and you're thinking, oh, that would be really interesting, yeah, and you just come out with it. Um, so it all sounds like a failure of attentional executive functions. So, is it a problem? Well, it's, it's one of the highest, it's one of the strongest risk factors for poor mental health in early adult life. It's also a very strong predictor of criminal activity later on. Is it a social problem? Um, Apparently, well, apparently not, in the sense that the shared environment doesn't play very much part. Um, but, uh, you know, and you only get small differences between rates in different societies. But then you have this massive difference in, in the amount of drugs that are being given out. So if that's the case, then it makes it very difficult to explain, um, you know, the, the, the difference in... Di in um, prescription rates in the US and the UK, that, that must come down really to attitudes to using drugs rather than um, differences in, in, the, in the prevalence of ADHD due to cultural differences, if we don't believe that those are strong. How we measure cultural differences though, it's very difficult. So I think one has to take this with a pinch of salt. I'm not entirely sure we should be confident that there is not um, you know, a strong cultural factor in, in ADHD. Yes? Yeah, so we don't know. We don't know. I mean, all we can say is, all, all we can say is that if you've got a diagnosis of ADHD, you know, it, you're more likely than those people without a diagnosis to have mental health problems later. But you're, you're absolutely right that that could be a reflection of living with a label. We, we don't know that. So it doesn't establish causality? No, no, it doesn't, no. No. So that, you know, it's one of these things I was talking about where you have to be very careful how you say things. So we've said it's a strong risk factor. 
but we haven't said it causes. So a risk factor is not the same as saying it causes. Is it a physiological problem? Is it, is it biological? Well, you get high heritability. So high heritability means that if your parents are both got ADHD, then there's a quite a strong likelihood that you're going to have ADHD. If one of your parents, you're still going to have above normal, above average. Um, and these things are determined using you know, twin studies and, and those sorts of techniques. So, but what they don't do is identify the genes. So by looking at how much variability is explained in, in other ways, such as having very similar environments um, or very similar genes, we come up with this figure of you know 0.7, 0.8%, which means 70 to 80% of the, the variability in, in whether you've got ADHD or not seems to be explained or could be explained genetically in terms of your inheritance. But it doesn't mean that we have genes that are ADHD genes necessarily. We haven't identified them anyway because it could be um, a complex interaction between genes that we all have. And, in fact, the, there is a very strong genes-environment interaction. And that makes things even more complicated. So, and this, is, this is a difficult one, but try to think about this. Negative parenting, that means like bad parenting, so if you see parents behaving badly, by parents, by adoptive parents, so that's parents who have adopted children with ADHD, correlates... With, their, with the biological parents' antisociality. So, how bad a parent you are, how bad a foster parent you are with, with an ADHD child can be predicted by how badly behaved that child's parents are. <laughs> Which, well, what it, what it, basically what that tends to suggest is that the child is affecting the way the parent is behaving. So the child's genetic background is influencing their own environment. And so you get this complex gene-environment interaction. So it, it's, it, the important thing about this is that it, it means it's very... It, it, you must not start thinking about genes as necessarily destiny. Biology is not destiny. What makes it destiny sometimes is the way that other people react or the way in which you build your environment because you've got those genes. And if we know that, then we can encourage people to build a different environment. Okay, so it's not just about, about the biology. It's pointless thinking about the genes and the biology in isolation. They create an environment which then impacts on the child. So we have this complex gene environment interaction. So just because a child has these genes, it doesn't mean necessarily that the outcome is determined. If we know that it's brought about by the way in which the child creates the environment, we can interact with that environment, we can intervene with that environment and perhaps change it. Yes? Oh, well, no, I'm, I'm assuming it's from birth, but I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm assuming it's from birth. That, that's such a, that's such a, you know, that's such a complex set of like, relational things going on there, isn't it? That it's kind of yeah, so, but, but, but the essential thing is that the child's biology is creating their environment yeah. because it's, create, it's actually causing their parents to, to, to behave well. It is causing, I think, I think you can say the child is, co is partly responsible for the way in which the parents are behaving. They're not responsible, but they are influencing the way their parents are behaving. I don't think it depends on the nature and nurture of the, you know, how you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I think, I mean, I think in every parent-child relationship, it is a two-way thing, isn't it? 
You can't. You might say that the adult is, has the most responsibility. That's why I shouldn't have used the word responsibility. You might say that the adult has the most responsibility for the relationship. Absolutely. But the relationship is not wholly in control of the adult. Is it? Not if you believe that a child is an autonomous being. No. Yeah, I mean, I think it's good to go, go and read the study, but um, I, I suppose, you know, in this, in, with this audience, yeah. I think we need to be realistic about what we know scientifically yeah. about how development comes about. So one needs to be very careful not to go around giving messages that children are to blame for their developmental trajectories, because that's not a very helpful message, right? <laughs> no, and, and, and I wouldn't want to say that. But on the other hand, I think we, we do need to recognise the fact that children contribute to their, the environment they create socially around them, and that includes their relationship with their parents. And I think when you recognise that, um, that can be a good thing in the sense, not in terms of letting anyone off the hook or anything like that, but just in terms of understanding how the genetic background of ADHD comes to bring about the problems um, because the, the, the relationship is something you can intervene with more easily than you can the genetic background so once you understand how it's developing th that's why I think it's an important point to make I think measures of certain behaviours actually uh, yeah, I think reading the original study is probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'll do it <coughs> Farone, yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. It should be in there. Um, okay, so you're prepared now, I suppose, to look at brain images and say, ah, yes, that's just what I thought we'd see. So if you look at Bush, uh, well, I, I suppose we could start off with figure two. Actually, we're going, to not, we're going to start off with the more confusing one. So you look at figure two, Bush 2011, and you look at all the different regions that appear to be different in the brains of children with ADHD and without ADHD. And you can see there's a vast number of them. And so the first response to this, in, in term, we're looking at figure two, might be to say, well, actually, you know, this is, this is really complicated. It looks like the whole brain is affected. Um, and all of these are potential causes. But as neuroconstructivists, I expect you to say, ah, but the cortex is very, very plastic. Um, and if we're talking about differences in systems being more influential, then maybe the most important difference that we've found here is where? The cerebellum. Possibly the cerebellum. That's not a mad response. The thing about the cerebellum is we understand very little about it. We're still really getting to grips with the cerebellum. Basically the lower stuff. The lower stuff, yeah. So what's the lower stuff we're looking at here? Creation. Hands up, please. Hands up. Yeah. Striatum. Striatum, striatum. Tomatoes, tomatoes. I have no idea, actually. Probably depends on where you're from. But the striatum definitely is, is of, of most interest. Caudate and the putamen. Because that is feeding impulses to the cortex and, and really has a lot to do with the way in which the cortex wires itself. Yeah. When you look at these, and we see these quite a lot in different studies, it does look like people with ADHD have a vastly different brain. But it's yeah. hard to know if you were to look at each brain scan, how, how much difference is there? I think that's a really important point to make. So how do you end up with these brain regions? You average over probably hundreds of children, actually, in terms because this is a summary. And if you looked at the brain of one child, would you be able to say, oh, oh an ADHD brain? No, you really wouldn't, I don't yes, think. Me and my friend, neither of us have ADHD, but our brains might look quite different. Absolutely, and they might even look like that, yeah. if you looked at the difference between them. So it, at an individual level, you have massive variation, <laughs> and there's no sense in which you can put a child in a brain scanner and say, oh, look, they've got ADHD. 
Is it possible that it's uh, an aspect of this diagnosis would be that it's uh, slowly developing? Could could be. Um, I don't know. I'd have to look at Bush 2011. I imagine he's taken that into account, age differences, and possibly, you know, and, and in terms of a delay in development. But I, I, I don't think... I don't know. I think that's an interesting question, actually. I'd have to, I'd have to look. It's something you'd have to look at the review, really, whether you could explain it in terms of delay. I've never heard anybody talking about ADHD in terms as a delay. But um, maybe, that, maybe that is... Um, yeah, that's a possibility. He talks about it in terms of a delay. Ah, he's talking about it in terms of a delay in terms of visual processing, though, isn't he? Which I find quite odd. I'm not going to argue with you yet. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I disagree. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure. It, it, yeah, so he's got a slightly different take, I think, on... on, on yeah. He's the, he's the person I always bring up at the end and say, but you know, we still don't know, and other people have other theories, and then I, I bring up that one. But, um, okay, so if you look at figure three, now this seems to really be getting to the nub of the problem, maybe. This is with adults, adults diagnosed with ADHD, adults who have not got ADHD, they're asked to attend to a task. This is a coronal section through the brain, so it's going straight through the anterior cingulate cortex, which you'd find in that white square. And look, normal controls activating the anterior cingulate. Adults with ADHD not activating the anterior cingulate. So does this mean that the anterior cingulate is the issue with people with ADHD? Is it about dysfunction of the anterior cingulate? Broken anterior cingulate, if you like. Hang on. Hands up, please. Sir. <laughs> I mean, could it be that just a, a dysfunction lower on just means that, that um, a different area of the brain just sort of gets, decides to be involved with those processes rather than... Yeah, I mean, I think it could be a simpler explanation than that, almost. Uh, um, I mean, what they are being asked to do is to pay attention to this task. And clearly, one group is, at, is paying attention and the other group isn't. <laughs> I can think of an awful, awful lot of different reasons as to why that might be, which might, you might not say with ADHD. It may be that these people, they have a lifestyle that they ended up with them not eating before they've gone into the scanner. Um, or it may be that they need an adrenaline-filled life, and this is really quite boring. I, I, you know, it's, I, you have to be very careful how you interpret these, sir. What extent is it in the structure of the brain, for example, or like 40 myelases or myelinated like or no or brain? What extent is it biological based on more structure? Well, the structure itself will come about as a result of, of um, during development, as a result of. Um, the way in which the systems operate. So we find structural differences, but are those structural differences, especially if you're talking about the cortex, they're not necessarily stronger evidence for determination. You know, if you find a structural difference in the anterior cingulate, does that mean therefore we, we can be sure it's determined? No, because actually that's, that's the cortex, a very plastic region of the brain. Um, so we don't know. Is, is, a, is what I'm saying. But we can't, we can't necessarily give more weight to things because it's structural than because it's a functional difference. Uh, was that lady there? Did you have your hand up? No. No. <coughs> Sir? Um, but you said Hang on, I said, I said six possible questions. Didn't I say six maximum questions last time? <laughs> okay. Um, you said earlier on, though, that there's, that there's not much social interaction with ADHD in terms of... so in terms of using that as a differentiating factor here? Uh, no, I didn't say there was not much social interaction, but I mean, certainly it can influence social interaction. No, but I mean, in terms of variability, uh, inflating the variation of diagnosis? Uh, uh, no, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. You said that um, there's not much, for example, there's not much differentiation between culture 
etc. Oh yes, apparently. So uh, well, yeah, apparently one 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 analysis has said that there's not much difference in terms of the prevalence. Yeah. So kind of explaining this in terms of different lifestyle. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think you were comparing apples and oranges there, because you're looking at the prevalence related to different countries, and here I'm talking about difference between two groups of individuals, with or without a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, so, I mean, all, the point that I'm really just trying to make is that is that there's a lot of things influence whether you activate your anterior or how much you activate your anterior cingulate. Um, you know, you could come down to personality traits and other things. It's really what you're really showing is that one group is not paying attention. But isn't that what we know already? Because that's the diagnosis, and so these things become circular. And producing a brain image makes it look more impressive. But actually, we're not sure, necessarily sure we know more as a result of producing this image. All we know is they're not act they're not paying attention. Um, very quickly. Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, they're, they're presumably... You see, the thing is, I suppose what is quite interesting is that you might argue they're not paying attention to anything because uh, if they were paying attention a lot to an alternative task, you would still see it activating. So if they were spending a lot of attention thinking about what they're going to have for dinner tonight instead of doing the task, they would still be activating the anterior cingulate. So this is where, by the way, we, are, we run into difficulties by not including phenomenological perspectives, not including the experience of the participant. Because I'm not sure they asked the people. Um, and, and one of the problems with neuroscience is that it, it does always take an outsider perspective and it, it, it rarely asks the participants, what were you doing? Or what do you think you were doing? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, I should have said, and that image is created when they're doing a Stroop task. Um, so, the Stroop task that we did earlier. But the, um, what I find more interesting and a bit more convincing, and this is certainly t taken hold, I think, as the predominant explanation for ADHD, is that you see a difference in the activation of the striatum. And that that's important because Striatum is about, well, it's about a lot of things, but it's very involved in response to reward. And your response to reward orients your attention. So when they asked people to um, anticipate getting a reward, so they're playing a game and they think they're about to win 20 cents, $1, $5, they can measure that midbrain response, the activation of the striatum in anticipation of the reward. And as you increase the reward, so you would expect to see an increase in midbrain dopamine, an increase in striatal activation. And you see it in both cases, but in the case of those diagnosed with ADHD, you actually see an under-activation quite clearly. It's getting bigger, but it's always under the activation of those without the diagnosis of ADHD. So it's possible that we have here a reward system that is less specific in its response. It's less specific in orienting attention. It's not discriminating between $1, $5 as strongly as a, a normal brain, if you like. It's, it's dodging about the place. Because when you have a strong striatal response, it orientates your attention. But if you haven't got that response, it's, it's much more difficult to become fixated on one topic or one goal. And this is an example, of course, about how systems can influence cortical development. And we were talking about, um, in neuroconstructivism, about the importance of an underlying system. Because you can imagine that if your reward system is not orienting where you're attending to, your cortex is going to end up being wired very differently. Things that would Normally, uh, you would spend a lot of time on, if your striatum was activating more, you will be spending less time on it. It would be more equally distributed. 
So that's the striatum there, that's what we're talking about, the putamen and the chordate. It looks a little bit looks a little bit like the hippocampus, but the hippocampus is actually ar around it. So this is a bit further into the brain. Um, and you've got the thalamus sort of peeking out there. And the ventral part of it here, we have a little nucleus, a gathering together of neurons called the nucleus accumbens. And the more that that activates, the more that you want something. We used to think it was a pleasure region of the brain, now we think about it more as a desire region. And it activates in a whole range of different things. And we saw recently in a study we did here, it activating when students were answering educational questions. So it's not just relevant to sex, drugs, rock and roll, it's much more relevant to your everyday sorts of activity. And it helps you orient your attention. And if that's under activating, then you're going to see um, a very different type of behaviour. So just, just, just finally before we leave that, um, this gives you a bit more of a sense, I think. You've got control activation in white, you've got ADHD activation in black, and you've got overlapping activation, and you can see these are transverse sections, and the white blob in the middle is where your ventral striatum is and you can see that it's much more activated in the control activation. So all that activity in white is not being observed in those diagnosed with ADHD. You're not seeing that ventral striatum activation. And one of the reasons I put that on there is because it's reasonably recent compared with the shares paper, I think. So another way in which we've gained insight into ADHD is to understand how the drugs work and this is a little bit backward you sort of think well hang on aren't we supposed to understand ADHD and then devise the drugs but as so often happens in psychiatry we, we, we find a drug that does something to the brain we find out if it works in various different situations and it does appear to ameliorate a lot of the symptoms of ADHD so if we understand how the drugs work then maybe we'll understand better what ADHD is and this kind of aligns with this explanation of dopamine deficit. The idea that that... Um, actually, I haven't explained that. I'd better go back a minute. Sorry, I should have said... Whoop, 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 whoop. I should have said here, when I talk about dopamine deficit, when you want or desire something, it involves an uptake of dopamine from this area here, the ventral tegmental area, so dopamine travels up here to your nucleus accumbens. That's, that mid, that's the, what activates the nucleus accumbens, it's the midbrain dopamine. So that's the thing that codes for your desire. And if that is weak, then you're going to have trouble orienting your attention. And what Ritalin does, or methylphenidate, is to reduce the house cleaners that go in and get rid of the excess dopamine. So you have dopamine transporters that take away the excess dopamine after you've experienced your uptake from the ventral tegmental area. If we reduce the activity of those chemicals, and we reduce the amount of excess dopamine that's being taken out, then we can increase the amount of dopamine the brain is producing in a stimulus-specific way. So if you see something and you're trying to orientate your attention towards it, and you're interested in it, then you get your midbrain dopamine response, but it's going to be stronger if you reduce the transporters that would normally take away the excess. And that's how it works. And of course, that would be true for people with and without ADHD. So all of us tend to focus better when we take methylphenidate. Now, to understand this image, you need to remember that here we're looking at the dopamine transporters, the, how much dopamine transporters we've got. So if we want a lot of dopamine, we want to see... Um, we want to see a reduction in the number of transporters that are taking it away. 
So if you're looking at these images as a measure of midbrain dopamine, the weaker the hotspot, the more midbrain dopamine you've got. And what you see with these individuals that are doing a maths task, with and without methylphenidate, is that you get quite um, a strong image here, and because they're, they're not really doing anything and they're just taking a placebo. Methylphenidate and a neutral task, so they're not really uh, trying to apply their attention, so that means they're not really producing the midbrain dopamine in the first place. We see quite a strong signal here, which means again we haven't got very much midbrain dopamine. Here we have a placebo and a mathematical task, so they are trying to get into the math task, but they, they're not having their excess dopamine removed, so we're going to have reduced, not very much midbrain dopamine again, so that means we have a strong image. See, it's all back to front. But the weakest image, the weakest activity we get, and I know it's not very clear, but this is what the authors claim, <laughs> the weakest activity we get is for when we've got methylphenidate and a mathematical task. This weak activity means you've got a lot of dopamine, um, sorry, you've got very small dopamine, very small number of dopamine transporters, so you've got a big amount of midbrain dopamine. And that's because you've got a task which is producing the midbrain dopamine and engaging you, and you've got methylphenidate, which is not taking away the excess. So as a result of that, you get the most midbrain dopamine and the least signal here. And what's more, what I find really interesting here is the fact that the, here they did ask for some self-report. They said, how motivated do you feel? And the more motivated they feel, um, the more midbrain dopamine is, is measured using this approach. And it may not just be about compensation, because it may be that Ritalin actually normalises striatal function. So there's quite an interesting study done in 2011 that showed even when they were taken off the medication, they were still actually producing more midbrain dopamine as a result of that medication than those who had not been taking the medication. So it may be that methylphenidate actually increases even when you come off it, the amount of midbrain dopamine that you're producing. Um, but it is a very controversial area. And there's a lot of self-help ar around. There are different attitudes. This is an American... Um, am I going to be able to play it? These ADHD guidelines will help you decide if a checkup is in order. You will need an analysis of their behavior, an idea of how long it's been going on, and a visit to the pediatrician. Step 1. Note their capacity for concentrating. Most young children have short attention spans, but those with ADHD don't seem to be listening even when they're spoken to. They frequently lose things, have difficulty following instructions, and often make careless mistakes. Step 2. Recognize that their energy level seems excessive even for a child. Are they unable to sit without fidgeting? Do they get in trouble at school for leaving their seat or running and climbing excessively or inappropriately? Do they talk incessantly? Interrupt constantly. Some children are more inattentive than hyperactive, and vice versa. Girls are more likely to have more attention problems, while boys more often fall into the hyperactive category. Step 3. Consider how long the behavior has been going on. If you've observed symptoms for more than six months, it might be ADHD. Step four, note where the behavior takes place. If it's only at home or only in school, something other than ADHD may be to blame for their symptoms. Step five, gauge the seriousness of the problem. Children with ADHD are regularly disruptive at school and at home. Their behavior causes problems in their relationships with both adults and other children. Step six, if you recognize any of these symptoms in your child, take them to your pediatrician. It's important that they have a medical checkup to rule out other causes for their behavior before ADHD is diagnosed. Did you know, children whose mothers had smoked while pregnant were more than twice as likely to have ADHD as children whose mothers did not smoke? Yes, I mean, 
I mean, you just get an impression of, of how, um, how this is very much a behavioural diagnosis. You know, there's no genetic test, there's no neural test. We're talking about something which is a, a label that we find helpful, arguably. Um, it's, it's not a medically diagnosable condition in, in, that, in, in, in any objective sense. It, it, ultimately, it, it's about how we interpret behaviour. The adult one is the adult one. I do find a little bit humorous. I've got a bit. I think it's the video though, right? How old are you? Eighty-eight. 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 Eighty-e
and then of course there's Castellanos. <laughs> I mean, yes, that's the one. <laughs> Many other theories continue to be debated. So it was shown that there was, I mean, I think Castellanos is, is interested in this, oh no, it's actually Prowell that's interested in this visual idea, that there's possibly a bilateral reduction of grey matter volume in the early visual cortex. But then of course, you, you know, going back to how we talked about cause and effect last time when we were talking about dyslexia, if there's a problem with visual processing, should you not be able to see that in simple visual processing tasks? Um, so we have to think carefully about these alternative ideas. We need to have evidence from many different perspectives to understand learning and to understand learning disorders. There are concerns and issues that teachers and parents can help with. This shouldn't really be just about um, GPs, doctors prescribing drugs. Um, it's teachers that and parents that see most of the behaviour most of the time. And it is behaviour that diagnoses this disorder. You know, I mean, teachers and parents can say whether there are improvements, what the self-esteem effects are. I mean, that's something that really the takers themselves, where are the views and the opinions of the children themselves? Um, that needs to be included as well, the experiential phenomenological perspective. I think whatever happens, we, we have to avoid a very narrow biological approach to this. We can see differences at a brain level, but we know that that doesn't necessarily mean that they are determined biologically or entirely determined biologically. We can see <coughs> heritability, but we also know that the, the child's behaviour will, will create an environment and that environment will impact. Um, we can take pills that appear to ameliorate, ameliorate the symptoms, but those pills also help people without ADHD to focus and to concentrate. Methylphenoldate is the most popular cognitive enhancing drug that is being used by students at the moment. Um, statistically, probably around eight of you are taking it at the moment, even though you shouldn't be. We measured it. We measured it in a, as part of a dissertation. It was around six percent. It was around six percent. But in some countries, it's much higher. So, like in some universities in the states, they've they've found there's about thirty, forty percent of students are, are taking it. Should just put it in the water. Should just put it in the water. Absolutely. So, really, if we're going to accept that it's not just biological, but we have to consider these other perspectives as well, then a multimodal approach that takes into account managing the behaviour, um, talking therapies. As possi you know, possibly in addition to the medication appears the most um, sensible approach. And this is interesting because I just wanted to show you here that actually um, you know, the pharmacological approach doesn't improve, for example, you know, your, your, your mathematics um, very well. Um, and generally speaking, you know, there are other approaches like non-based psychological approaches that will improve your mathematics um, and also um, multimodal perspectives have been shown to help with language. Generally speaking, in terms of educational impact, methylphenidate is not that great. Methylphenidate doesn't really raise grades and so the argument in academic terms for taking it tends to be more about managing behaviour. Okay, so that's where we are. We've looked at working memory, we've looked at the supervisory attentional system, we looked at this battle between the anterior cingulate cortex and the prefrontal cortex, and we've also discussed ADHD. And I did say at the beginning, why are we looking at our mistakes? Oh, stop. Oh, God, that's one of them. <laughs> <laughs>